Welcome back to MMA Sucker Fight fans. My name is Nate Freeman, and today I am joined by Will Starks, who competes at LFA 122 on January 21st. Will, how are you doing today? I'm good. Just got finished up with uh, my deload week of strength and conditioning. Uh, and now I'm just now I'm just polishing up the finished product and I'm excited to show you guys what I have coming next Friday. Fantastic. Um, like I mentioned, you're facing uh, Glossio Elizario at LFA 122 uh, a week from tomorrow. Um, just give me your thoughts on him and him as an opponent. Well, uh, as far as what footage shows, he's a pretty uh, aggressive, fast-starting striker. You know, uh, so he has some decent grappling offense. Um, but you know, overall, I mean, he, he, he seems to trend toward fast starter and then fizzles out. Uh, now, it's not not to say that he hasn't improved and you know maybe is aware of this issue and has worked on his pacing or just his conditioning overall. Uh, you know, with that being said, you know, I'm, I'm prepared. I'm prepared to fight the best of what I've seen in his footage, you know, over the course of 15 minutes, if need be. Fantastic. Um, and, you know, this is your uh, fifth fight in the span of a year, basically. Um, talk to me about, you know, before that you had um, had not fought in a while. Talk to me about um, how excited you are to be back actively fighting a lot and fighting, like I said, five times in a year. Yeah, so I had that loss to Abdurakman, uh last January out in Abu Dhabi. It was a, it was a pretty close fight. And, uh, you know, I, I did try to get back, uh, hop back onto the scene pretty quickly after that. But we had a lot of difficulty finding or securing a, an opponent, at least at the local level. Uh, so then, I, I, like you said, I had that really active season um, last fall for about two and a half months. I fought three times, uh, all of which were victories, and actually had a showing on LFA. Um, so, yeah, no, I mean, I, I'm, I was excited to have had an extended period of out-of-camp training, you know, to, to really, uh, as I said on my social media, re recreate myself, you know, I've had some time to analyze my my habits, my tendencies, and my overall biases uh, or biases from a stylistic standpoint. Uh, so, you know, it was nice to take some time to heal, uh, regroup, and you know, improve fitness metrics, and then really decide in what direction I would like to take my career as I discover my MMA identity. Uh, you know, and you know, people ask me, you know, how are you gonna, you know, how are you gonna win, or what are your favorite tactics or styles it's you know it's nice to really just to to know who i am going into the cage it uh, it definitely gives me a uh, a greater sense of peace uh, and security as i you know the face any opponent yeah and can you just sort of expand a little bit on that about your mma identity how you what you feel like you are um and how you've evolved even over this past year like you said and since you've become a pro in uh, 2018, 2017? Yeah, I think yeah, I'm in my pro debut January 2017 with Titan FC. Uh, so I, I was fortunate enough to have started training, at least in combat sports, pretty late. You know, so I was a cross country runner for, for the longest time. And, you know, that wrestled my senior year and then uh, for a season and a half at a uh, Division II university. But when I started competing regularly in MMA, it was under the tutelage of Rob Hewlett, my current head coach. Uh, I had a stint from about 2016 to 2018 where I was living in Texas, uh, and I trained under uh, Chris Brennan. He's a jiu-jitsu, you know, globally renowned jiu-jitsu black belt. Uh, but for the most part, I've, I've, I've worked under Rob, and he's he's really focused on blending the styles. So he, he has like a – a sambo and no holds barred background, you know, his hands in folk style wrestling as well. Um, you know, so he's a bigger, you know, bigger guy. We always joke around and call him a caveman. So, so it's, it's, it's been, you know, it's difficult for him to, you know, re really, really convey his, his, or it had been difficult for him to convey the exact message or to display exactly how we would like some of the smaller fighters to execute certain techniques just because, I mean, he's, you know, he's a six foot one, six foot two, you know, 240 plus pound guy. You know, he's not throwing, he's not throwing a lot of his techniques, but he, um, 
he understands fighting very well. He understands combat very well. Uh, and so he, you know, he, he never really developed me or anyone in one particular area. He just focused on ensuring that we were prepared mentally and physically from a gritty standpoint to use whatever tools we had in a seamless fashion. And, uh, you know, that's, you know, as far as evolving that, you know, bringing a sports science background into uh, MMA program design, you know, you, you, you have to begin to or organize your training in a logical and sequential manner. And so uh, I can't even remember at what point I, I th this term was inspired, but I started posting on social media uh, a little mini series on like the four pillars of MMA, which is uh, actually um, a term that Pat Militage use, uh, uses or you know has used in the past when he was uh, coaching MMA. He uh, we, we talked to her in a fighter interview at one of my uh, when, when I fought for LFA against Slava. Uh, just now signed with the UFC, actually. Uh, anyway, he um, so four pillars of MMA, which I would say you know which which I call boxing, Thai kickboxing, wrestling, and then Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. <laughs> and then you could go further, and you know each pillar has its ancestral roots. You know from a hands only striking style. You know kickboxing. Uh, you know, having, you know, having roots in Eastern, you know, uh, you know, Eastern traditional martial arts, you know, as you go further and further back, like karate, taekwondo, and even further uh, wrestling, you know, you have parent and cousin styles like judo uh, and then Brazilian jiu-jitsu, you know, with his roots in Japanese jiu-jitsu and, and so on and so forth. Right. So you can, but if you, um, if you take it a step further, then you can organize those four pillars into two schools, obviously striking and grappling. And then eventually you, you land at the, I'm doing like an inverse pyramid right now. I guess I should go the other way. Um, right. But eventually you end at the, you know, the top of the pyramid where MMA, um, you know, it is your landing point, but ju just, just, uh, so, so I guess a good way to describe this would be like um, strength and conditioning periodization or, annual planning and so when you're prepping an athlete in the weight room if you're a strength and conditioning coach you will start very general right make sure they get generally strong and generally conditioned right you know so on the strength side it's okay let's make sure they can move a pretty dang heavy weight you know they, they can push pull squat and hinge you know and you know carry and whatever uh and then on the conditioning end it's like okay make sure they have a solid vo2 max or a good aerobic base so then on the anaerobic side, you know, your more explosive, uh, fast switch movements, you have a solid, uh, what was I described, as, described earlier? It's like if you, if you have a fire, uh, you, you want you want to make, you, you don't want just, you know, like a handful of twigs and, and, and leaves, you know, to, 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 to keep your campfire burning. You want to make sure you have some, damp, you know, you know, some hefty logs and then plenty of sources of fuel uh, so that you don't run out quick, you know, um, and, and then the closer you get to the fight, uh, the more specific your training will get, where you'll you'll go from, you know, ro you know, long runs on the road, uh, or sorry, long runs on the road and conditioning in, and then maybe, you know, just general heavier loaded, uh, you know, like general weight training to more sports specific intervals on the conditioning side, and then really focusing on peak force production, uh, you know, with within the time and speed constraints of your sport. Uh, and so the same way with mixed martial arts, like, okay, I'm in, I'm in out of camp. Like I was saying earlier, uh, following that really busy fall I had last year. Uh, so I'm out of camp. So let's, let's go ahead and go back to those four pillars and use data or film, you know, film study from all of my fights and look at what, what I tend, what I prefer when I'm competing and look at the proportion of, you know, of each four pillar that I use and then how well I'm executing each technique within each style. Uh, so then I can shoot, you know, I can figure out which is my strongest and which is my weakest. Uh, and then I can choose a primary goal from there. Like, okay, I want to make sure to keep my strongest strong and it'll still improve, but I need to bring up this weak point. Just like, you know, if you're making a video game character, you, you know, it's like, okay, I'm going to take them to a training phase and we're going to emphasize this one area uh, that's lagging. Right. And then the closer I get to camp, the more I, fo the less I focus on, each individual one and the more I focus on finding the common thread that blends them together so that I'm not as, as Rob, uh, my coach would say, I'm not just boxing, 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 boxing. Okay. Pause for a second and let's try a takedown, but it's more box of uh, the principles that allow me to generate a lot of force. Maybe that like from a bio biomechanic standpoint for like a hook, you know, any type of punch or, 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 or leg strike. Right. I, I think I, 
I learn or I understand how 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 those spill into the same biomechanic uh, biomechanics that would allow me to enter an upper or lower body attack as well. So I'm like, okay, it seems like a hook kind of sets you know loads my hips and sets me right up for a good level change into a blast double or you know like a, a lead leg pivot switch uh, head inside single or something like that. Uh, that way they look like one move. You know, as a, as opposed to two separate, uh, two distinct moves that an opponent can then read, uh, because at the, you know at the end of the day, as as John Donner heard said, this is this is a chess game with your limbs on the on on you know as pieces on the line, and so you you can you can move your pawns one step at a time, and and, and you can think one move at a time, but at some point as you climb levels, you're going to have to think multiple steps ahead with pieces that carry a greater magnitude of effect right so your knight can move you know up and over you know or over and up and you know you have a you know i mean your queen piece you know like move any direction you know any direction in infinite amount of spaces and so it's like okay how does each how, how does each piece play and getting me to my end goal and then when i move one one piece or when i move maybe two pieces what is likely to be the response like the, the the response from my opponent and in what direction and, and that's uh i mean that, that that's what makes mma you know mma so beautiful but that's uh that's also the fun artsy part of uh, i guess recreating yourself so and that i guess that's, that's a, a long roundabout way of explaining how i would start general and then go specific uh as far as recreating myself sure that makes sense um so i think one you said basically you're working better on blending everything together and making sure that you know you don't just throw a punch sit back and then go for a takedown or something like that um mm -hmm. sort of like i know i wrestled my senior year of high school like i was always taught you know don't just go for a takedown and just stop like chain wrestle go for other takedowns go for other moves and all of that um mm -hmm. so just sort of the mma version of that um, and then you said basically that you're trying to be less reactionary that, um, you know, you don't just do a move and then see what the other person does and then react off of that, that you already have multiple things in mind um, that you want to do. And you you're basically leading the dance now, basically, is what it sounds like. Yeah, that's exact. So. Uh, I, I hesitate to use this example because I'm still uh, I'm very new at it. Uh, so like with when you're troubleshooting or like when you're coding or something like that, you have like A, like A, B, and C, right? For situation A, you can choose to do one of three options, and then you have you know like or you have like so A one, A two, A three, and then A one sub article, you know whatever, and so on and so forth. Uh, so long as you're aware of the most of uh, the most realistic situations that could happen for any given situation and then you train accordingly right so you know when you do as far as downloading that information it's you know watch film study and then drill right a actually code the pattern from a neuromuscular efficiency standpoint so you can do the move well you know it's one thing to just say oh i know that when someone you know when an opponent throws a punch I need to do this. It's another thing to make sure that your body can do it efficiently under realistic situations is where, you know, drilling comes into play. Um, you know, so, so, so you, if, if you create, if you can create the largest possible troubleshooting network and then have that trained, that, that that's, that's where, uh, so St. Pierre quoted a, a while back. He had said like, my confidence comes from preparation. Like what better way to, you know, what better way to assure your confidence in winning any, in any situation in life than to then to know that the largest network of sequences for combat is encoded in your biology you know it's, it's like, like I, i've done I, i've done so many uh, you know i've done 10,000 repetitions of the most foundational offensive and defensive sequences for striking and grappling so I don't have to worry, uh, you know, and, and, and I've had, and it's been affirmed in competition enough that I know, uh, so one of my teammates, uh, or, you know, or one of my students rather, he said, you know, a, a win next Friday will put you at a career record of 30 and three, meaning 90% of the time I'm winning, you know, so it's like 90% of the time, everything that I do in preparation is reflected in competition as a win. So I know, you know, so, so you know, like, like, 
ninety percent of the time, like I know that anything that happens in the cage, which is chaotic, like do- doesn't have to doesn't have to uh, create such a, you know, such a high arousal state or you know, uh, you know, I don't have to doubt myself nearly as much, or uh, I don't have to be overly concerned about the what ifs game uh, with, you know, what my opponent could or could not do because I've, I've my, at the foundation, I know 90% of the time there, there are unconscious responses that are, that are carrying me through, you know, in most, most situations in a fight. I'm also curious Um, on one of your social media posts after your last fight, um, you sort of talked about this, that you gave yourself a score like, oh, my striking was like a 76 or something like that. And my grappling was a 98 for an average of like an 80, whatever. I'm bad at math. Um, (laughs) is that, (laughs) is that based at all in data or was that just something you were, um, just sort of saying, because you, it sounded like you had. Um, based off of what you said earlier, some some type of data to sort of back up how you saw your performance. Yeah, so so I have a, a fun project that I'm doing right now. I'm going through the UFCPI's uh, second volume of like their comprehensive assessment for combat sport at, or for MMA fighters. So the, the the cool thing about this era of MMA is that uh, like exp- the experience is great. You know, it's undoubtedly I'd say one of the, the key factors in allowing an athlete to, to, uh, I, I suppose, claim prestige uh, and qualify them the coach, um, you know, being able to actually use data, uh, you know, to, to have an objective means of measuring individual and team progress uh, is, is the direction that all, you know, all, all things, uh, or, or I suppose it is the, it should be the primary means of pushing any given industry or, or sport forward. And so the UFC has, has been compiling stats for however many years now. I know, um, like, if you go to UFC stats and you can look up each fighter, each weight class, and like, or like average, you know, like, uh, you can look at records for like total strikes thrown over the course of their career or, you know, average strikes thrown per round, total control time on the ground, et cetera. Uh, so now we have a database to actually measure you know, like measure where you stand and how much, you know, and, and, and then you have, you have a, a means of creating or periodizing your sport program design. So that you're like, okay, my athletes right now are throwing this many strikes per round during their sparring sessions, or they're getting this many takedowns and controlling this long and getting this many submissions. But athletes in the UFC right now are performing at a, you know, at a magnitude, you know, two or even, you know, two or 2.5 times higher than that. My athletes are not ready for the UFC, especially since they're competing against each other, you know, in the gym and still, you know, and and still missing the mark. Uh, And then you can also do that for competition. You can, you know, so at this point, I think I'm competing against people that are on the cusp of breaking into the bigger four promotions. So I can use my data from these fights then it'd be like, okay, how did my striking in this fight and how did my grappling or, you know, how did my striking and grappling in this fight measure or, you know, how do they measure up against some of the stats that the top lightweights in the world are putting out? And then from there, I, you know, and then then there's still the subjectivity factor there as well. I'm, you're your own worst critic. And I never like to give myself, I mean, I, I give myself credit, but I'm very hard on my performances from a, from a I guess, a, it's an obsessive compulsive standpoint so i I desire to to be as close to perfect as possible um so you know if if i look at you know if i look at how i did in a fight and it doesn't from a data standpoint match up where i expected myself to be when i compare myself to the guys i want to be competing against uh that gives me a good you know a a good estimate of how well i'm actually performing which is where you know I, i take like okay i give myself a 70 70 or so percent, you know, like, uh, you know, like I mean, you know, I got 70 strikes. He got a hundred, you know, uh, fi- top fighters in the world are getting a hundred strikes, you know, over the course of three rounds. Um, and then, you know, I got four, you know, or I got, you know, a five out of five takedowns, uh, but I missed, you know, and I got like, uh, you know, I landed however many strikes while I was on the ground and top fighters in my weight class around the world, 
according to you know according to UFCPI are executing this much. So I, I'm I'm performing at an A level in grappling, but I'm still performing at a C level in striking. So then you take the average, and overall, I give myself I give myself a B, right? I'm a B level, you know, UFC fighter right now, and that that's a, that's a good push. It's like okay, I am good, right? I'm not just average. I am good, but I want to be great. So what do I need to change in my training to ensure that I'm competing at a level? Um, and then obviously the goal would be to create a, not now I'm using like a, I'm stepping out of the real world and using like a, like a comic book, like a comic book grading system, you know, like, like S class, like super, you know, it's okay. So you have, you know, C, B, A, and then above A would be my, my S class. So how, how, how do I become an outlier within this division? Let, let's, let's look at all the outliers like the Khabibs or the St. Pierre's or the, you know, the guy, the guys that, compete so far beyond the average you know they're like um you know like a standard dis distribution in statistics you have like a you know one two or you know, three standard deviations above the mean so it's like these guys are so far ahead of the curve like that by the time the average guys catch up they're either gone or they're retired like how do i make myself one of these guys and then and you know and then beyond uh, that, that, that i mean that's that's in essence what i what i'm working on and that's that's kind of what i use to inspire uh, my self-report following fights. It's really interesting. I do my best. Um, bioinformatics background in undergrad. Yeah, sorry, you, uh, you cut out for a second. Uh, can you repeat that? I heard the last part. Sure. So I, um, I was asking, you know, you're... Um, fascination with all this data and stuff. How much of your um, degree in bioinformatics um, has helped we helped you with your interest and helped you with um, sort of breaking down all of that data and like letting you know sort of what everything means? Yeah. So the the bioinformatics uh, declaration is, uh, is is a fairly it, it's a fairly recent move. Uh, my academic journey. I originally was majoring in exercise, sports science, and nutrition, uh, and, and you know I, I was at the University of Central Missouri during that time, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do with a degree like that, and you know I ended up you know I was a terrible student, you know ter terrible getting assignments you know in, and but you know I knew I wanted to fight. Um, you know that being said, you, know, you we fast forward a few years, and uh, you know I'm back, I'm at home in Columbia, tr pretty pretty much training full time to prep for uh, IMAF Worlds. Uh, you know, then working toward personal training and nutrition certifications, you know, and kind of getting practice, practice, personal training friends and whatnot. Uh, one of my buddies, Jared Feather, uh, who, who works for Renaissance Periodization, he's their, their head contest prep coach. Uh, so he was still at university at the time. And he was, you know, telling me about this new guy, uh, this new professor that had just moved in town and was teaching exercise phys, Dr. Mike Isratel, and how smart this dude was. And uh, they were uh, RP at the, at the time was they were, they were just in their infancy as far as launching the business. Uh, so they had a few YouTube uh, YouTube videos like exercise tutorials, and then Mike uh, had a few of his lectures up. Uh, so the scientific principles of um, uh, scientific principles for dieting for body composition. Uh, and I met Mike uh, during during that period, like 2014 and 2015, and he had gave me an, an email copy of their the, the first edition of their uh, scientific nutrition principles book. And I remember reading through it, and that was one of the first times that, like, so I, as as I'm going through the book and RP, if, if you're not familiar, or any of the listeners, if you're not familiar, they're they're they're, they're probably the leaders right now in all things sports science. Uh, and like I said, on the performance in, for for strength training, uh, conditioning training, or nutrition, they do the best job at compiling the entirety of data on any given area of performance and then take taking the average right so 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 you have an, an understand like a, a profound understanding of the tried and true principles uh that that under like the physiological principles that underpin everything right and then helping you organize these things to a hierarchy of relevance so that you understand where you should be investing the most of your energy or focus for like, okay, I want to lose weight, you know? So obviously, 
you know, energy at the end of the day, energy balance is going to be at the foundation of that pyramid. And then as you climb up, you know, up and up and up, you know, go, you know, you go through your macros, uh, you, you go, go through your micros, your nutrient timing. And then at the very tip top, you have supplements and whatnot. Uh, so they, they do this. And, and then they also help you understand which, which methods or, or, or which data should be let go of, right. You know, like, uh, as far as fads and fallacies go, so that they, they will point out bogus in the industry and be like, this is, this is why this isn't a good investment of your time uh, or your resources. And then they'll also help, uh, help you understand what some of the more cutting edge, you know, or so like forward minded, uh, yeah, like c- cutting edge practices are and, where where they where they should fall on that hierarchy of relevance again so um so again you're you're not wasting time but you are investing you know investing all of your resources in creating a strategy that falls closest in line with what is true um and so i remember re- reading through this first text and i was i was fast i was blown away i was like man i didn't i didn't even realize that you could you know, I, I said this house probably 21 or so, and I didn't realize you could think so logically and sequentially about at the time it was nutrition, but it's it it's began that principle think, thinking in that manner began to spill into all areas of my life, uh, at, at least those that I was competent in at the time. Um, and so we fast forward, you know, and I you know I have, I have my certifications in uh, you know personal training, nutrition, and then more CEUs. Uh, you know, to keep those in good standing and I'm a licensed massage therapist. And, you know, then I find bioinformatics, this field of interdisciplinary medicine that combines biochemistry, mathematics, and computer science, you know, so you can you know, understand DNA and RNA sequences and, uh, you know, translate that into uh, data that can be replicated so that you can, you know, begin to forge powerful solutions you know, way, way faster to a greater degree of effect than, than could ever be done. Uh, you know, and so, so yeah, I mean, the, 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 I said the bioinformatics wasn't what started my fascination with taking data, uh, sport performance data and, you know, and, and then using it to create my programs, but it, it overall, uh, for, I guess from a data analytics standpoint, uh, is, is now something that, it gets me very, very excited. You know, it, it definitely, it, it pushes me, uh, it, it pushes me, it gives me confidence that I can accomplish many different things in life from a sports end, from an academic and from an academic end, just because again, if you have the confidence that you can download, so to speak, you, you can download qualities or attributes into yourself and they can be expressed through your physiology, uh, then, you don't really have to worry about any things. You can forge a plan. And so long as it's realistic and falls in line with the principles that govern reality, you know, you will accomplish it. You, you will or can accomplish it to a certain degree, give or take. Interesting. That's really interesting. Um, I'll, I really need to look more into that. That's yeah. That's all just really interesting. Um, can you talk to me, switching gears a little bit, about your time as an amateur with the IMMAF, um, as a two-time world champion for um, basically the governing body of most amateur athletic or most amateur MMA uh, fighters? Um, talk to me about your time there, and then I have a couple other questions based off of that. Yeah, um, it was fun. So at the time, IMAF uh, the IMAF World Championships was my was my end goal, I suppose. I mean, my, my end goal was the UFC, but when when the opportunity for IMAF um, came about, I was I, I was I was tunnel visioned on that, you know, on it. So I originally I wanted to make the 2014 team, uh, but I had a lot my, my first and only loss in my amateur career October of 2013, and you know, so I ended up uh, taking taking some time off to recover. It was a TKO. It was like like flash TKO on my feet, so I, you know, I had like a 90 day suspension. Uh, so you know, I spent time obviously getting healthy, uh, you know, but, but I wasn't able to get in enough fights to get, you know, to get my name back into running, at least for, for, you know, Rob, Rob wanted me to just wait and develop myself for, you know, for all of 2014 and then give it a go the following year. Uh, so at that time we were, we had a facility in Columbia called Heart of America Athletic Training Center. 
And it was one of the first times I think for Rob that he, he began to have a, we were building toward having a staff because at the time MMA in the Midwest, uh, you know, we, we had some bigger gyms, you know, around St. Louis and Kansas city area, but in Columbia, there wasn't really, uh, and there still really isn't, as I say now there is, but uh, there hadn't been for the longest time, a unified program where coaches with different backgrounds work together to teach their individual style, but then also collaborated to, to make sure that the fighters could blend them. Uh, it was just, it really was just Rob kind of teaching fighters how to fight. And then you had a jiu-jitsu coach across town who didn't, you know, you know, didn't want to do that and vice versa. And then a karate coach and a kickball, you know, just everyone kind of doing their own thing. Um, so I was training with Rob in 2015, you know, comes around, I have regionals, I win and, I, and I'm building confidence uh, and I'm you know, getting excited, excited for this new thing because, you know, uh, UMAF and IMAF and all the other governing bodies across the world were working to, to push MMA into the Olympics. Uh, and I mean, it's still not there yet, but that was that was the vision. And so it, it almost created this uh, this call to action. You know, there, the, the, the exigency there was, you know, like, let, let's let's gather together, you know, as a country. And even though we're competing against other countries, we're all united, you know, to, to represent the sport to the best of our ability so that someday future generations will be able to compete at the Olympic Games, uh, you know, and, and their future through the sport of MMA uh, will be so much brighter uh, than, than what we were able to experience. Uh, so it was, it was kind of cool. It felt, it felt really big. So 2015 was a, it was a, it was an amazing year. Uh, you know, I, obviously I wanted, I had more, no, I had less, I had four fights that year. Um, and, you know, so I had the opportunity to meet guys like Jose Shorty Torres and his coach, Master Bob Shermer, who was a former uh, Team USA head coach. And, you know, going out there, we got to, I'm trying to think of guys who were out there. Forrest Griffin was out there at the time. Uh, he made a guest appearance. I think Matt Hughes made a guest appearance, uh, and it, it was it was also a cool cult, uh, cultural experience, you know. So being being in Vegas, like the mecca for combat sports competition, at least in the United States, it was uh to see all the teams and interact with them, both both from a, like a language standpoint, they're both verbal and nonverbal, uh, you know, and all their mannerisms, and, it, and then even looking at how each country trained, you know, uh, I remember there was one point I was walking uh, through the casino and w one of the, uh, one of the teams, like a far Eastern European team was doing warm up drills against the wall. And I was watching how organized they were. And, and, you know, everyone had team uniform <laughs> except for team USA, but you know, most other teams, they all had uniforms and uh, it was, it was an enlightening experience. You know, it was one of the, but, and so thinking back, what was interesting about it was I felt inadequate at that moment because I, you know, because I mean, Hewlett House MMA, it's a small hole, hole in the wall gym here in the Midwest. And I'm looking at these, you know, these teams of, you know, people who have been training since they were children, you know, and whether in boxing or, you know, people, you know, people who are purple belt and above in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu or, you know, have, we have black, black belts in karate and Taekwondo. And I was just a kid who made his MMA debut at 18 years old with, you know, you know, a sum total of, you know, like three or so years of wrestling and, you know, that much of boxing. I didn't have a background in martial arts. I just uh, would. So side story that I'll bring back really quick. When I walked out for uh, when I walked onto the University of Central Missouri's uh, wrestling team, one of my good buddies that wrestled with me told me, he was like, these guys are going to be a lot more experienced than you. You have guys that have been wrestling since they were kids. So until you bridge the technique or skill gap, you're going to have to be as strong and as conditioned as reasonably possible to make up for it. Uh, and so that, that, that is what I had. I had a tremendous amount of athleticism and then the, the sports specific grittiness and conditioning uh, from Rob, because he, he really did have a, he, he had what I would, what I was still, I would now consider a tried and you know, tried and true uh, approach to prepping uh, MMA fighters. So going back to worlds, I, I just didn't, I didn't feel like, I didn't feel like I was that crisp, polished martial artist that all these other guys from the countries were. And yet I was, I was winning, I was beating them. Uh, so I remember winning and not even really believing that I won. Now, you know, I was excited. I was excited. I, you know, I felt great. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. I got the medal. And I think that year there, I don't think there was a belt that year. Um, you know, and I, you know, it was, it was, I felt cool coming home, but you know, in my, in my head, 
there was something that I thought was going to happen within me after, you know, upon and after winning worlds, you know, I thought winning worlds will result in, I suppose, in the snap of the fingers being what I thought you had dreamed of, you know, or, or being what I thought, you know, being what I had dreamed of for so long, which I suppose was, was whatever I thought UFC superstars were or how they felt. And I didn't feel that in that moment. I just kind of felt, uh, I want to say empty, but it just, it was, I won the fight and they put the medal around my neck and they gave me the title. I am after world champion. And then everyone went about their day, you know? And so, so going home, it was so disillusioning. I'm like, well, now, now what, you know, and you know, people, you know, applauded and praised for a bit. And then they went back to their normal lives as well. And that was one of the first moments I realized, I'm like, man, the, you know, the, that, that old saying, the destination, you know, the, the goal isn't the destination is about the journey or some, something like that, which, you know, you, you have to unpack that a bit more to get, or at least for me to give it some, give it some real meaning. But, but I, I realized I'm like, okay, winning the thing is not the goal. You know, like, like if, if winning the thing is what I'm, is what I'm seeking or, a, you know, acquiring a, you know, a title, you know, or a certain level of prestige, if that is, if that is what I'm seeking to validate my identity, then it ends, it, you know, it ends. And if it ends, then so does everything I invested my identity in. And I don't, uh, it took me, I mean, I didn't learn, I didn't learn this during that time. It took me until now really to, to put it, you know, put it, commit it to heart. But, you know, I realized if I, like, like, uh, if I continue down this, it's going to destroy, it's going to destroy me in a sense, because I, I will never believe that I am enough or, you know, I'll never feel as fulfilled as I hope to, because I'm, um, I'm, I'm seeking validation from a temporary external source. Uh, so I was actually really depressed, uh, after 2015 worlds, uh, extremely, I don't even think I competed that, uh, for the rest of the year. Um, and then I had the opportunity to do it again the following year. I didn't really want to, but it was it was an opportunity to become the second ever two-time amateur world champion. And there was supposed to be an abundance of opportunity on the other side. Uh, and you know, so the second year wasn't it didn't have the same magic as the first year. You know, it was, you know, had some per, uh, you know, it's like personal relational issues going on during that time as well, but. Overall, it was fun. The competition was better. The promotion was more polished. They had, they had team uniforms, uh, not team uniforms, but uh, we had competitive uniforms at the time. We had like rash guards we competed in, you know, blue and red corner. So it had a different, it definitely had an Olympic look to it. And that, that was pretty cool. Um, and but, but I ended up competing against uh, Alexander Martinez out of Canada again in the finals. We were on, just seated on the opposite ends. Uh, yeah, and I beat him more definitively. And uh, I felt, I did feel good after that. Uh, the, the first year that I won Worlds, I felt like I was a good fighter and I athleted my way through it. The second year, I felt like I didn't feel like a great martial artist or like I like I dazzled people with you know like amazing technique or anything. But I felt like I understood martial arts enough to do to 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 outperform every competitor in each area. On top of having still brutalizing conditioning. Uh, uh, you know, strength and conditioning as well. So, so I felt better about myself. Like I did, uh, and I, I did feel like I deserved the title, you know, amateur world champion or two-time amateur world champion. Um, and, 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 and I, I felt the wave of hype after the second world title win too, because it, it felt, it wasn't easy, but it wasn't nearly as hard as, it wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be the second time through. Um, so then, yeah, I mean, that, that was, I mean, that was pretty much the entire experience, you know, after that, uh, after that, you know, I prepped and ended up moving to Texas for, like I said, that two and a half or three year stint. Uh, and then I made my pro debut and, you know, then from there we, you know, we, we, we have a, an entirely different story and then we fast forward until now. Yeah, nice. Fair enough. Um, so you touched on this a few times while you were um, going through that, um, that the IMMAF is trying to 
basically get MMA into the Olympics. Um, and so far they've not been successful, but they've um, started, especially recently, they um, got WADA uh, signatory status. And that's a big step towards um, getting more recognized by the Olympic committees and all of that. Um, talk to me a little bit about what you think it's going to take to get the attention of different Olympic committees and potentially eventually get MMA into the Olympics. That is, it's hard for me to say anything definitive because I don't, I don't know exactly what the Olympic committee is looking for. You know, like I, I don't know what their standard operating procedure is for onboarding new sports into the Olympics. My, my understanding is that they, uh, the IOC wanted a distinguishable look from amateur to pro competition, which I think has been accomplished with the rule set, no elbows, no, no ankle locks of any sort, I believe maybe, maybe straight ankle locks, but definitely no twisting ankle locks. Uh, seven ounce MMA gloves, as opposed to four ounce. And then the addition, uh, uh, and then uh, grappling shin guards. So they're just like the, the sleeves that you can pull on. They're pretty snug. So they don't slip off. But, uh, and so you can throw, you know, kicks, but you can also grapple without having to worry about the bulkiness of traditional kickboxing guards. And then, uh, so three minute rounds as opposed to five for pro, which is standard for amateur, I believe anyway. And then finally, uh, the addition of just the, the competition uniforms. So I think I mean, I, all of those aforementioned variables are, you know, are, are, are important or crucial. And on, on top of that, I think just a bigger push globally, you know, for, for countries to continue to, to sanction MMA as a legitimate sport at the amateur level. And for, I mean, this, I mean, at this point I'm speculating, but you know, I, I would imagine just like boxing has many different uh, credible, you know, leagues from youth all the way up to adult uh, for amateur boxers, you know, they go through, you know, we have golden gloves and, uh, uh, there's, there's one that I'm forgetting, uh, ringside world championships, uh, you know, and wrestling obviously has a standardized program throughout, uh, you know, youth programs in high school, and then a trend, you know, you can get scholarships to go to college for it as well. Uh, I, I don't imagine schools hosting MMA programs for, for, you know, for, for their students, but, but I, I do, I, we are already seeing, MMA gyms collaborate with local high school and youth wrestling programs around their, uh, you know, ar around the parts, you know, so that they can both feed each other. And, and the same thing's happening with like boxing and jujitsu schools. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I think just seeing, just seeing mixed martial arts normalize as an actual practice, uh, as an actual artistic practice with, um, maybe implications that span beyond the sport as well. You know, I mean, I said, I know boxing is not necessarily in schools, but there are a lot of, uh, you know, boxing, you know, within the boxing community, they kind of use it to help troubled youth get off, you know, get off the streets and, you know, push them in a, you know, in a direction that can get them out into the academic or working world. Uh, you know, and high school sports in general for a lot of youth are, you know, a lot of students are an outlet uh, that they can use to kind of find to find themselves uh, and as a as an extrinsic motivator to keep their keep their GPA in good standing throughout high school with uh, the hopes of getting maybe a scholarship and even if they aren't a great college athlete they can at least have a portion of the school paid for so they can do you know decent or great throughout university to ensure you know a decent or great job uh, and, you know and, and I think that's I mean, I, I, I'm not exactly sure what the IOC stands for. I think, uh, you know, you talked about uh, IMAP partnering with WADA, and it makes you think about, uh, I can't remember where I heard the lecture, um, but it was a discussion on how the WADA uh, gives criteria to ban uh, substances. And one of, the, one of the questions posed was, does it compromise the integrity of the sport? And the first one was, does it, uh, you know, does it meaningfully enhance performance? Enhance performance? And I think, the other, I think there are three total than the others. Obviously, uh, you know, is it dangerous? You know, does it cause harm to the athlete? Um, but as far as uh, the integrity of the, you know, the integrity portion, uh, I think if you talk to many old heads, you know, in sports or or in any organization, 
most people want to see people do better in life, period. Many coaches that I talk to uh, use coaching not not simply as a means to make money because it's if you want to make a lot of money, you're, you're probably not going, going to be a coach. Uh, you, you, you'll, you'll go into the medical field or something like that um, uh, for the most part, at least. But they, they coach because they're passionate about impacting lives and, and drastically improving the quality of lives for, for people that often feel left out. Uh, people that feel lost, uh, you know, and, you know, maybe they're very self self unaware, or, you know, or they're they're, uh, you know, afflicted with some, you know, some uh, some psychiatric or neurological condition, and maybe in an environment where uh, help isn't a readily available resource uh, in, in in the way that can really, you know, move them forward and. Oftentimes, boxing or MMA gyms are, are a safe haven. You know, they're they're uh, as as uh, as we say in 2022, it is a safe space for you know for people to to collaborate and to grow with each other. And I mean, the cool thing about combat sports is you get to be aggressive legally, so you can get that energy out, especially young people who need to. I mean, people. Period. You need to move. You need to. You need to to exercise. You need to breathe. You need to express yourself. And uh, you know, I I think that's that might be something too. Is uh, you know, the IOC from from their standpoint, if they you know they're viewing all all the sports, it would be. I, I imagine they would you know when they look at the the MMA light, you know, make a ping on their map. Or on their radar, it's like, oh, MMA is start, you know, from a, an objective standpoint, people, you know, kids who are involved in MMA at a young age, you know, seem, you know, seem to do this much better, you know, across, you know, academic or, you know, occupational metrics. And that's pretty cool. We should probably endorse something like that. Uh, you know, so, so maybe, again, in the presence of everything else that I had mentioned before, maybe it's just, ensuring that MMA isn't what it was viewed as during its early onset, you know, in 1993, which was human cockfighting, uh, you know, or no holds barred, but it is truly an artistic expression of many different individuals across, you know, across all cultures, uh, you know, so that they can, you know, they, they can experience, you know, an, an abundance of, of, you know, of all things, of bliss, of, uh, you know, direction, you know, with, with work and in life uh, in, in, in the same way other sports have allowed people to do so. It's got a, uh, it's come a long way in the sport of MMA, um, but um, to see it in the Olympics, I think would be really cool. And just, yeah, it, just uh, it shows how long, how far it's come and um, how much more professional it is now. Um, switching gears back to you, um, you are setting yourself up for a big 2022. Um, first and foremost, you have switched management to Paradigm. Um, talk to me a little bit about A, why that change was made, and B, um, how it's going with them so far. Yeah, so after my last fight uh, for XKO, I was reached out to by a few different agents representing their agency <laughs> agents representing their agency is great. Um, so originally it was, I narrowed it down to three and I, and I wasn't even aware of a fourth option. And so uh, when I looked at the three options I had at first, um, I, I, I wanted to look at, you know, I, had, I had a list of questions that one of my, one of my other coaches from Texas that I'm still in contact with, uh, Stephen Wright, he kind of wrote them out for me. It's like, these are things you want to look for in an agency, you know, percentages that they take, you know, endorsement deals that they can offer, uh, you know, their, their connection with the big four and skin of the game, et cetera. And then I just had a list of, you know, personal questions to follow up with that. Uh, and, and then I also just wanted to, you know, how I uh, wanted to know how well I got along with the agent I was talking to that'd be representing me for the company. Uh, you know, so I had a conversation with, you know, all three of those first options and, and I cross analyzed, you know, I was like, okay, you know, this, you know, option one obviously wins here, option two wins here, et cetera. And, uh, you know, took the, you know, the, the great, you know, the, you know, the one with the, the most pros and, uh, went with that one. And then, uh, going through my DMS, you know, you have like Instagram, you can go through your requests and you see all these people that you're not friends with that, 
messaged you like two years ago, you're like, oh, dang, uh, I should probably you know open these and read them. Um, but I had one request from an, an agent representing Paradigm. And, uh, you know, I looked up Paradigm and, you know, saw how credible they were. And I think one of the biggest things that appealed to me off the get go was uh, that their website featured, uh, you know, a chart highlighting their standard operating procedure. And that, like I said, just, just the fact that they have a system in place means that they, they likely have a really good understanding of principles, uh, not that a picture on a website, uh, you know, in, in, in the case that other companies don't do the same thing. Uh, but like I said, that, that, that was, that was one thing. And then talking with the agent, um, yeah, it, it was a good conversation. We had the same type of, uh, synergy that, uh, the, me and the original, uh, well, my, my, my original first choice did. So I got along with this person, probably actually even a little better. And then on top of that, the athletes that represent Paradigm are just, I mean, I mean, they're great. They have Israel Adesanya, Conor McGregor, Manny Pacquiao, uh, Chris Cyborg, uh, Stephen Thompson, you know, the list goes on. And then, uh, you know, and so, you know, to, to represent an agency who hosts a roster with those athletes you know, on top of having an organized approach and a team that has been doing it, and they've leveraged the biggest deals in boxing and MMA uh, and women MMA. Um, you know, and then I believe when uh, my agent was going through the pitch, I, I want to say in 2014, they officially became the largest MMA agency in the world. Uh, you know, it's so like in addition, you know, so that in addition to all the other baseline questions I had being answered, and level or better with my first three options, it was it was just the obvious choice. You know, I mean, there, there was there was no, uh, there were, I did, didn't have too much friction about it. I was, uh, I guess I was frustrated that I didn't, you know, that, that I didn't see that option at first. But uh, you know, it was, it was just it just boiled down to a very you know quick, uh, short, simple conversation with my original option, and you know, he wished me well. I'm still. You know, still in contact. And I, th I think the cool thing about situations like this or with um, in the sport of the agencies is that we're also learning, you know, the sport's still very new. And so uh, these agencies, even though they compete against each other, they're still learning and growing. And, you know, you have athletes move from one spot to another and, you know, uh, uh, it, 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 it's a healthy type of competition. I think that it will, that will, uh, I guess, circling back to the Olympic question, um, I imagine what they'd also want to see. Uh, I guess this 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 statement will, I think will will glue everything I said prior together uh, pretty well. Uh, but having a standardized approach to getting an athlete from youth to amateur to pro to big four, you know, uh, in, in the in the same way that they do for collegiate sports. Uh, and if you can tie in. Uh, the, the, you know, the, these are ideas that I think are, are likely are being worked on, but, you know, you can tie in GPA incentivized or like academic incentivized uh, programs or systems within these MMA gyms. I, I definitely think that that would help uh, push MMA into the Olympics. Um, but, you know, so that, that was, that was another conversation I had with my agent with Paradigm also. Um, and I said, so that their, their vision uh, for, for the future of MMA uh, coincided heavily with mine as well. So uh, we work well together. My agent, he was a fighter. He pretty much, he stopped pretty much where I'm picking or, you know, pretty much where I'm at now. So he gets to pick up where he left off, but help, you know, help me with, you know, with, uh, with a mature and seasoned perspective, you know, he's made the mistakes, but he's been there right on the cusp. And now he works, you know, he works for an agency with people who have done it to the biggest degree. So, uh, it's a good fit and, you know, it works well. Shout out to Carl Reed. Um, yeah. Yes, sir. Two time on the contender series. And that's where you're hoping to be after this fight. Um, talk to me a little bit. Um, I know one of the things when we spoke earlier um, that Paradigm is wanting you to start doing is uh, start interacting more with social media and um, creating your own YouTube channel. Can you just sort of explain a little bit about, um, what your thought process is behind your YouTube channel and what kind of content you're going to be putting out. Yeah, so this is something I should have been doing a long time ago, but uh, the goal of the YouTube channel really for uh, in the beginning is just to help people follow follow my MMA journey a bit better with, with, with more detail. Uh, so, you know, I want to share 
you know, day, my, my, my day to day life and I, you know, how I organize my schedule to get training, coaching and school done. Uh, and then also, I said, dive into each of those areas as well, you know, more, more specifically on the training side. So show them what a typical uh, striking or grappling or MMA practice would look like uh, and then show them what a, a, a typical strength and conditioning session would look like as well. Uh, you know, and then from there, my, my, my hope is to start doing what a lot, a lot of sports science coaches do, and that's have playlists, uh, you know, playlists that my followers, uh, you know, or my subscribers can click on and be like, okay, this is, you know, here's a playlist on power development for the, you know, for the MMA athletes, or here's a playlist on nutritional priorities uh, for, for a combat athlete when they're trying to, you know, make weight or something like that. And you have like a five or 10 minute snippet of, you know, uh, you know, like on the diet and it'd be like, here, here are the scientific principles of, you know, dieting for body comp while paying attention to your health. And this is how you can organize your schedule around training, you know, uh, to structure your meals to get you there. Uh, and then the same thing for the strength and conditioning or sport. And uh, I, I think that there are already, coaches doing this, but I, I think the more, uh, the more videos, more content we have like that, the better the future MMA, uh, MMA competitors will be at, again, aligning their lifestyle with the principles that underpin top performances. And if I can break, if, you know, if I can break those principles down, uh, you know, it, it, you know, with, without this, you know, scientific vernacular, you know, jargon and just, reduce it to a very simple message that, you know, that, that my viewers can digest, you know, and early, you know, at, at a, you know, a much earlier, t uh, at a, a much earlier point in their career, I said that they can be, you know, achieving nearly the same results that took me 10 years and a fraction of the time. Yeah. And I'm looking forward to following it because I mean, it's based off of this conversation that we've had today. It seems like you're really good at explaining things and um, really passionate about the sport of MMA. Um, obviously, <laughs> obviously as you're a fighter, um, but happy to be you like, you know, to fight people, you know, do you like right, it? Not yeah, really. <laughs> um, so I'm looking forward to following it. Um, so as we close here, can you, um, are there any sponsors or any people in particular that you want to give a shout out to, um, any, you know, any plugs you want to fill like any, uh, yeah. Shout out your social medias as well. How can people follow you and all that? Right on. Well, I mean, you guys can follow me at, uh, Will Starks MMA on Instagram. Uh, first and foremost, I want to shout out my, my home gym, Hewlett House MMA, uh, our facility is Columbia Training Academy. And we were doing an amazing job at, you know, building the most comprehensive martial arts program. So, uh, you know, myself running a lot of the striking and I would say Coach Rob Hewlett heading the MMA program. Thank you guys. Uh, coach Ty Lathan uh, with, uh, you know, our, our combat grappling coach. Thank you for being a badass in all things, takedowns and make you know making the ground a, a place of suffering uh dallas jennings for you know, your jiu-jitsu for mma class and you know like i said taking a, a a brutal approach to securing uh securing submissions uh, in the sneakiest ways um and then everyone you know all the other staff that you know helps keep the facility running smoothly thank you guys very much uh shout out to renaissance periodization uh and Dr. Mike Isertel, a good friend and you know, a mentor for a long period of time. Thank you for introducing me to the scientific principles of training and diet and allowing me to use science uh, and now uh, in inspiring a fascination with mathematics to live, you know, live life in a way I didn't think was possible. Uh, and then the same to my good friend, Jared Feather with RP. Um, and then for local facilities here around Columbia, Missouri, uh, NutriShop. Um, let's see, uh, Mizzou, the Mizzou Neurology Clinic, uh, the uh, Mizzou Neurological Concussion Clinic. Thank you guys for you know, being a part of keeping athletes, uh, contact athletes safe. Um, and that's pretty much all I have for now. Anyone else that I forgot, you know who you are. Thanks for being part of my journey. Uh, give it to you, Nate. And then for the YouTube, it's just going to be your name, Will Starks, correct? Oh, yeah, just YouTube Will Starks, and I said it's a small following right now. I'll be picking up on uh, content after this fight and throughout this year. My goal would be to have uh, a lot of momentum built and 
Hopefully you guys enjoy learning the art and science of MMA.